Bethlehem College and Seminary is still accepting applications for the coming academic year. For more information, visit bcsmn.edu. Lord, um, we love our kids. Uh, it's a great privilege uh, to be parents and uh, for, to be entrusted with eternal souls. And so, Lord, we feel so helpless in the face of human frailty and human sin. Uh, and so we ask for help. We ask for help to deal with our own hearts and ask for your help to deal with our children's hearts. And so God bless us now this morning as we talk and think uh, and pray for our sons and our daughters. Be with us now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Book of Proverbs has, my son, give me your heart. My son, give me your heart. Uh, I think that's one of the more fundamental verses for me as a dad is what do I want? I want my kids to give me their hearts. And it is very hard sometimes to get their hearts. Um, I assume we all want this. Uh, we want so much good for our children. We want them to flourish. We want them to thrive. We want them to grow and mature. Most importantly, we want them to know Jesus and to become the men and women that he's calling them to be. And the reality is they are often a mystery to us. I don't know how you feel about your children, but our children sometimes can feel like, what in the world is going on with you? And my hope for this little workshop right now is to put the mystery in the right place. Put the mystery in the right place. So maybe just at, let me get a gauge of where we're at. How many of you have grown children out of the house? Let me just see that. All right. Interesting. How many of you have children who are, in, or who are teenagers? 13 and up. Okay, number of those. How many of you have only children under the teen years? Okay, good. So we've got the cross section here of parents in all different categories. That's wonderful. And so you'll have to adapt to your particular circumstances all that we're going to say. So here's what I want to start with. Uh, I want to start with what we know about our children. Okay, what we know about our children. And so I'm going to walk through five things that I think we know about our children. Here's what you know, okay? And then we're going to talk about what you don't know and how to figure out what you don't know. So number one, they're made in God's image. That means they have a soul and they have a body, they have a mind, they have a heart, and they were made to represent God and reflect God in this world. So one thing you know, one thing I know, maybe that's a better way to put it. Here's something I know about all of your children, having never met them. They are made in God's image. Okay, so you know that. It's not a mystery. It just is. Okay, number two, they are either male or female. It means they are either a son or a daughter. Okay? Now think about that. Okay, this is actually a really important feature. It's a feature that the world is determined to ignore, forget, and mess with. But to be a son is to be a potential father and a potential brother. Every son. That's what it means to be a son, is this is the sort of human being who grows up to be a father and a brother. Likewise, what does it mean to be a woman, to be a daughter, is to be the sort of human being who grows up to be a mother and a sister. And that, that potential is present and real from the beginning, and that's true regardless of whether you have other children and then therefore they have biological siblings, and it's true regardless of whether they grow up and get married and have children of their own. The fact is that as a male or a female, they are a son or a daughter, and therefore a potential father, potential brother, potential mother, potential sister. That's just baked in, and I know that about every one of your kids. They are in one of those two categories. And this means that these fundamental facts about our children, that, that biological, uh, sexually differentiated fact, is accompanied by a bunch of different traits and tendencies, okay? This is when we talk about things like boys are generally taller than, and stronger than girls, and they tend to be more aggressive and thing-oriented than girls. Girls are more nurturing and people-oriented, and those sort of like cluster on a bell curve sort of traits, all of those emerge from those basic fundamental facts, either a male or female, a son or a daughter. And, and so these, these sort of traits emerge from and serve the fact that they are going to become fathers and brothers, 
mothers and daughters, and they carry those different traits and tendencies into all of their relationships. Okay, so that's number two. That's what I know about your kids. Number three, they are finite and they are fallen. Okay, so that means as finite, what does that mean? They are finite creatures who grow. That means they begin as immature and then they grow into maturity or not. They begin as immature and they grow. That's what it means to be fine. Immaturity, therefore, is baked into the cake by God's design. This is not a broken feature. This is a design feature. Now, as fallen, they are sinful and they are broken. That means that they are both corrupt and they are weak. Okay? Or fallenness means not only that we're sinful, but it means we're broken. So they are, there's both wickedness here and there's weakness here. So those created tendencies, those sexually differentiated, clustered on a bell curve sorts of things that serve being a potential father or potential mother, those traits have been twisted, distorted, corrupted, and taken in funky directions by sinfulness. And I know that about every one of your kids. Number four, they are born into a family. They are born into a people. They are born into usually, in this case, a church. And that means that families have cultures. Churches have cultures. Peoples have cultures with various kinds of relational dynamics and habits and practices that channel and shape those natural tendencies, both the good ones and the distorted ones, in particular directions. In other words, one thing I know about your kids is they are born into a web of relationships, both in your family and in your family's wider network, the church, community, nation, etc. And that forms and molds and shapes them in particular ways. And then finally, here's the fifth thing I know, they have an eternal destiny. They will either experience eternal joy in God's presence or eternal misery under his judgment. And right now, wherever they are, they are moving one of those directions or the other. So those are five things that are not mysterious. You don't, those are just baked in, and I know them about your kids, and you know them about my kids and your kids. That's the things that you know. So I want you to think of those things that you know as sort of boundaries. Everything else about your kids, you have to figure out. Everything else you have to learn, to study, which means you have to get curious. So the main focus of my talk here is on parenting with curiosity. And this curiosity necessarily flows from love. Like if you love your children, you will be curious about them. You all remember the words from 1 Peter about husbands? Live with your wives in an understanding way. Literally, it's live with your wives according to knowledge. Now, obviously, that applies to the marital relationship, but it also applies to other relationships, like the relationship between parents and children. You ought to live with your children in an understanding way. You ought to live with your children according to knowledge, and that means you have to study. You have to learn. You have to focus and give your attention to understanding and growing in knowledge, not just about the general stuff, but about the particulars. Or consider Psalm 103 up there. As a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. For he knows our frame, he remembers that we are dust. And so notice that the Lord's compassion there is compared to a father's compassion. That's the, that's the basic analogy. And then notice that God's compassion is tied to his knowledge of our frame. He remembers that we are dust. He knows what we were made from. He knows what we return to. He knows things about us, and that knowledge enables him to be compassionate to us, to tailor his compassion to our frame. And so also, you must know your children's frame. You must keep it in mind. God remembers it. You must remember it. But here's the difference. Unlike God, who simply knows it all at once and immediately, you have to learn it. You have to get curious. So curiosity, here's how I'm thinking about curiosity, often means applying what you do know to what you don't know. It's applying what you do know to what you don't know by asking questions and exploring guesses. In other words, there's an experimental dimension to what I'm talking about here. I gave you five things that you know, and now you're kind of kind of use those to 
focus in on, okay, I know these, so I want to ask some questions about that mysterious thing that just happened. And so here's a couple of things. I've got curious about them, curious about some relational dynamics, curious about yourself. Let's talk about them. What, what do you want to be curious about? What, should, what things should you explore? Well, you should explore their desires and their interests. You should learn what they love. That, shouldn't, that should be an automatic thing. You should know about your kids as they grow older. You should know, my son is the sort of person who just loves baseball. Right? My daughter is the sort of girl who loves to cook. You should know their interests. And you should recognize that while in many cases they will be the same as yours, because that's what it means to be born into a family, it doesn't always mean that. And so there will be surprises. Your son or your daughter may all of a sudden discover something that you have no interest in, but they love, and you should join them in that joy. But you have to get curious. You have to pay attention. So their desires and interests. Also, though, you should be curious about their fears and their frustrations. So you should be paying attention, and every kid here will be somewhat different. Certain kids love people. Certain people are afraid of being around too many people. Their anxiety comes in social situations. You should know which type of kid yours is, which means you have to pay attention. You have to learn. You have to dial yourself into whether or not they love this situation or they don't, whether they come out of their shell or whether they retreat into it. What are their fears? What are their frustrations? You should know their weaknesses and their strengths. You should know what your kids um, excel at. The places, even if they don't love it, there's things that they do that they make you just go, man, you're just really good at that. That was, you, you did that really quickly. And other things where you go, this is just really hard for them. This is, so, so you think about them doing their homework and you've got one child who sits down and just pounds it out just gets to it, gets it done, and the other one who just stares at that screen or at that book or at that worksheet for a long time. And you should go, they're different. And I need to, and then therefore, I need to get curious about why is this hard? How can I help them? How can I live with them according to knowledge? Because otherwise, our tendency is to make one of them the standard and say, because this son can do this easily, this son must be lazy for not being able to do it. And what are you doing if you do that? You're not being compassionate to your children. You're not remembering their frame. And then finally, you should know uh, their needs and their preferences, the, the, the sorts of ways that, you know, so the, the whole love languages thing, I mean, that guy's made a bajillion dollars, good night, but there's something to it, right? There's something to the fact that our children receive love in particular ways, and you should be actively studying how is it does, does my son, certain, one of my sons needs lots of physical affection. One of my sons, it's work. It's just not his, he, that's not how he is. But you could talk or do something, do an activity with him that will just bring him out. And if you try to give the son who, if I'm like, man, you need a hug, and he's like, I don't want a hug, Dad, <laughs> then pushing it over and over and over again may not actually foster the relationship. Whereas the other, if I, if I forget, if I don't remember his frame and remember why is he acting out, why is he having such a hard time, and I will say to my wife sometime, he just needs a bunch of hugs right now. Like, he, there's anxiety. What does he need? He just needs me to go wrestle with him for a bit. That's what he needs in order, uh, in order to, to work. And then finally, curious about them, curious about transit, life transitions. And here's what I mean. There's the big obvious one, right, when all of a sudden God, you know, sets off the hormone bomb at puberty, big transitions and you go, what happened to that little girl or that little boy who used to be so sweet and now all of a sudden there's this grumpy person running around my house? It's like that, there's a hormone bomb that went off. That's a life transition. Remember, your, remember their frame. Get curious. But then there's other transitions. There's, there's, so there's the movements from sort of childhood to adolescence and then from adolescence to adulthood, uh, often accompanied by the, the hormone stuff. But then there's also, uh, did friends move away? Did somebody die? Are there other things happening in and around them that are affecting them? And you're just seeing the results coming out sideways and kind of getting frustrated at that because you're not thinking, oh, you know what, so-and-so, th their friend from last year just moved away. Or that kid's family's going through a divorce and my kid may be anxious about that because that just came home to him. Or somebody just died and all of a sudden now he's 12 or 13 years old and death is real in a way that it wasn't six months ago, and that's coming out funny ways. So you got to be curious about them. 
but not only curious about them, you gotta get curious about the relational dynamics you're dealing with. So here's, this is important. This is where the sexuality really does matter. The relationship between a father and a daughter is not the same as a mother and a daughter. The relationship between a father and a son is not the same as the relationship between a mother and a son. And you need to be curious about the particular challenges that this poses to your parenting. You also need to be uh, curious about the, the, birth, the birth order, the sibling piece, right? So we all know the ambitious older child and the peacemaking middle child and the attention-seeking youngest child. And there is something that's real. Those books aren't just making that up. There are patterns and habits uh, and, and uh, consistencies in how those things work themselves out. It's not universal and you can't just pigeonhole, but there are uh, repeated patterns in families in terms of birth order, and that birth order then, and then you bring both of those together, and you have, there's a difference between having an oldest daughter, a middle son, and a youngest daughter, or having three boys, or having an older son and a younger daughter. All of those different dynamics are going to get crossways, and here's the deal. Parent, get curious. Why is it that my middle son responds differently to his older sister than he does to his older brother. Why is the conflict that way? There's something there. I need to think about it. I need to press in. I need to remember their frame. And then finally, the influence of their friends. Okay, you should get curious about this. Something comes home and you go, where'd that come from? And you should be paying attention. You should be attentive. Who are the influences? Who's at school? Who's on the baseball team? Uh, who's at the dance recital, who, what are the inputs coming in? That could be friends, that's the first one I think of, but also, of course, the media that comes along with that or that may be picking up other places. You need to be curious, and you need to see how are those inputs coming out in my children. And finally, you need to get curious about yourself. Okay, get curious about yourself. You need to get curious about your reactions. Okay, so this is, um, I'm tempted to start calling this, I, I say this, I think, just about everywhere I go, Clint's over here, my assistant, and he's like, yep, that's true, because he knows what I'm about to say. Uh, you need to pay attention to your reactions. Okay, this is universal. This is just life advice here, okay? This, but when it comes to our kids, there are times when they do something, and all of a sudden, without thinking, without intention, there's just a boom that comes up in you, okay? That happens with your kids. might happen with your spouse. might happen with other relationships. But there's just a snap reaction that just mm, hits the throat. You better get real curious about that. What was that? Where did that come from? Why did I snap that way? Why did I get so angry so quickly? Why was it so near the surface? What was it pressing on? So you want to think about uh, what is that pressing? What, what, they just did something. It pressed on something. It was a button, and, it, and I just snapped into action. Why? You might then think about your upbringing. Did that feel familiar? Did that reaction to what he just did or what she just did, did that feel like that's happened before? Is that something that's a part of some other relationship? You should ask yourself that about yourself. Is, it, is this familiar? And that begins to take you back and maybe think about your own upbringing, your relationship with your parents or your siblings or your relationship with your spouse. This is then the third. You ask about your marriage, okay? Am I looking in a mini mirror? So one of the things that you should get curious about is you will often see things in your children that remind you of the things about your spouse that are frustrating to you right? And so the child does something, and you react strongly, not just because of what they did, but because it presses on a certain kind of pain in your marriage, but you're taking it out on them. So rather than addressing it here with your spouse, you're letting it come out sideways at the kid who doesn't know why mom just got so upset with him or why dad just snapped that way. And if you press in on yourself, you realize, oh, I know why. It's because when my wife does that thing, it really frustrates me, but I just eat it because I don't want to pick a fight, and so I just eat it and eat it, and then all of a sudden my son does it or my daughter does it, and I go, hey! And you go, wait, what? All of that energy was coming from the marriage and just dumped on the kid, and you better get curious about that. What is, this, what is that reaction telling me about the state of things with my spouse? Maybe I need to do some work here so that I can remember their frame over here. All right, so uh, oftentimes we see our spouse's sins in miniature in our kids. Okay, here's the, the last thing here. I want you to keep some perspective as you're doing this. When we think about, oops, sorry, pull this up. 
How do you view the situation? What, what sort of things do you need to keep in mind as you're, as you're probing, you're getting curious about them, curious about the relational dynamics in play, curious about yourself? Here's some questions. Do you view your spouse as an ally or an adversary? Okay, here's, here's why this would be important. When you think about the relationship between, say, a father and a son, mother and a daughter, there's both assets and liabilities, okay? Here's the asset. Dad understands what it's like to be a teenage boy better than mom does. He's been there, he's done that, he has the t-shirt, still, okay? Like, dads get that, okay? That means it's an asset. It means when, when mom, there's been times when my wife has seen something that our sons have done, and she goes, is that normal? And I'm like, it's normal. And she goes, I don't, I don't think it should be normal, <laughs> right? But it is, it's just this, that's a teenage boy, being a teenage boy, it's not sin, it's different but it's okay, we need to watch it because it might, we might be bumping up the edges of, no, of what it ought to be, but it's okay. But she's, she's wanting to know, hey, you're, you, you've been there, you've done that, you're a man, tell me about that. So she's, she's getting that. So I can demystify things about boys. Similarly, moms can demystify things about girls. Like, why did they just break down? Why did that just happen? Where, where, did, that, where did those tears come from? I have no idea what just happened. And mom can say, let me, let me explain what girls are like. So that's an asset. On the flip side, there's a liability that comes with this because you, it's an asset when you de demystify and explain, it becomes a liability when you coddle and excuse. So a dad can go, hey, that's no big deal, when it actually is a big deal, right? That actually is a big deal. And mom's seeing something that, hey, we need to address that, and you're kind of going, hey, boys will be boys, girls will be girls, whatever the, the scenario is, and you can kind of coddle or excuse things because you understand from the inside and oftentimes that's a way of us if if we start <laughs> enforcing this on them then that might actually require me <laughs> to do the same right and so we can try to avoid responsibility for our own selves by not enforcing God's standards on our children and so but this is important do you view your spouse as an adversary or an ally and uh and and the other the other piece of this that I think may be worth reflecting on is there are times where you're going to be reluctant to hear what your spouse has to say about your relationship with one of your children because it will be hard for you to hear, right? And so if you say, I don't understand, I keep co having conflict, I don't know what's going on, and you say you finally have enough, and you say, honey, what do you think? And they say, well, honestly, and they begin to tell you things about the way that you relate in general to people, and that what's happening is that thing is coming out really ugly in this relationship with your child who's with you all the time and you could easily bow up at that moment and hey and then all of a sudden it's a fight and guess what next time you ask for their counsel it may be given a little less quickly right because they don't want to push that button and so do you view your spouse's insight as insight as this is an ally they're trying to help me they're trying to help me understand better my relationships with my kids and they may see things about me and about this that I don't see, and I really, I want to understand. I want to be curious. Uh, also then, do you view conflict as opportunities? This is a really hard thing to, to flip because you can be, conflict, especially in families, is just over and over and over again, and it can just feel like it's wearing you down, and instead you should go, this is an opportunity. Every time there's a conflict, it's opportunity. At the very least, it's an opportunity for God to sanctify you. Right? For you to grow in patience and gentleness and kindness and firmness and fortitude and endurance. It's an opportunity every single time you are in conflict. But it's also an opportunity for discipleship. It's a chance for you to say, okay, there was immaturity mixed in with some sin and some weakness and some conflict and some pain and all of that stuff just got dumped into my living room. Guess what? That's why you're there. God puts you there to have compassion, which is not coddling, but compassion on that. Opportunity to disciple, to patiently say, I need to, I need to help you. So in doing so, we help our children grow up into maturity. We help them grow up to be the kind of men and women that God wants them to be. That means that you have to be able to step outside of the reactive stream of passions and escalation to get control of yourself, understand your reactions, so that you can intentionally, firmly, and wisely enter back in with humility, curiosity, and compassion, okay? And the goal here is that you would produce maturity both in yourself and in your kids by the grace of God. So what do we mean by maturity? This is how we talk about maturity here at Bethlehem. 
and it includes these three elements. It includes a clarity of mind. So that means your vision is not clouded by your passions. You see clearly what you're dealing with and you're, you think about your passions, that's that snap reaction stuff that just kind of comes up into your throat. That acts like a fog. Right? You know what I mean? It acts like a fog. So think of the way that anger or fear or pity or desire can distort your vision so that you don't see clearly what you are dealing with. Clarity of mind means I know who God is, I know who I am, I know who they are, I know what they need. In other words, clarity of mind means you remember their frame. But not just remember, there's a stability of soul. So sober-minded, mature people are not easily tossed. Okay, they're not tossed by the winds of doctrine, they're not tossed by the passions, there's a steadiness to them. And so if you think about the kind of terms that show up in, in the, the pastoral epistles, like Book of Titus, Titus 2, You know, older men are to be sober-minded, dignified, self-controlled, sound in faith, in love, and in steadfastness. Okay, so if you're sober-minded, you keep your head. You don't panic. You don't overreact. There's There's a ballast in the boat that weathers the storms that are threatening the ship. And in your home, guess what, parents? That's your fundamental calling, right? Their immaturity is not a surprise. Yours is. Right? Oftentimes, we're like, Where, what is this immaturity? And it's like, well, it's the reflection of what you just did. So their maturity is baked into the cake. They're kids. You're the adult. You're supposed to be the spiritual one who can, with gentleness, correct them lest you fall into the same trap. And then finally, the readiness to act. Sober-minded doesn't just mean I see it, I'm steady, and I'm sitting. It means I'm ready to act. I'm ready to lean in. It's not apathy, not passivity, there's a deep feeling uh, about reality, about what we're facing. Because we keep our head, though, we're not reactive. We act with purpose. We don't react. We respond. Uh, and so here's what Peter says about that in his, uh, in his letter. Just listen to these texts about sober-mindedness and maturity. Therefore, preparing your minds for action, so girding up the loins of your mind. Remember, getting everything, putting on your, your belt, putting on your athletic clothes, getting ready, putting on your armor, ready to go. And being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus. Or again, 1 Peter 4, the end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. You've got to gird up the loins of your mind in order to pray and then be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour, both you and your kids. So prepared to act, ready to pray, watchful for dangers, curious about our kids so that we know how to act with intentionality in relation to them. And so here's where I want to... This presentation was made possible by the generous contributors to the Serious Joy Scholarship, permitting our graduates to launch into life and ministry without a burden of student loan debt.